Welcome to another episode of Geopolitics with Alex. And I think that today we have a very special treat because with us we have uh, my good friend George Yeo, who you might know has been a general in the army of Singapore. He's been a government minister in Singapore for over 20 years. Uh, but the biggest connection that him and I had was that we were foreign ministers at the same time. And I'll never forget it because it was a UN General Assembly week. And both of us were horribly jet lagged. We didn't know each other. We ended up in the same hotel and at about three o'clock in the morning, there are two crazy people in the gym on the treadmills. And we didn't sort of say hello or anything like that. But then later on, we had a meet. Hey, you were at the gym this morning, weren't you? So warm welcome, George Yeo. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Alex. Great. Pleasure to be here. Now, uh, you are uh, a member of our external advisory board here at the School of Transnational Government Governance, and we're especially thankful for that. And uh, you have given a speech to us, uh, inaugurating our great lecture hall here at Buen Talenti. And the speech had many different themes, but it's really about China's role in the world right now. Can you tell us, what do we in the West get wrong with China? Why don't we understand China? What's your take? Well, well actually, my main point is the role Europe can play to balance the relationship, the struggle between the US and China. Mm. And the stance Europe takes can make the difference between war and peace on this planet. So Europe's position is very important. And Europe's understanding of China is vital to managing this, this larger relationship. So you could kind of see the situation a little bit like you have these sort of three power centers, right? Like the United States, Europe, and China. Let's begin with the, with the China United States. I'm simplifying a little bit, but there's been a lot of talk about decoupling and of course the US making China its number one competitor rival and even enemy. And there's sort of you know, support for this idea across the aisle. How, how do you see the US approach to China? What, what, what are the problems there? What are the good sides and the bad sides? I think he had to, he had to come sooner or later. But in the last five years, like drops of litmus, like drops of acid changing the color of the litmus. No, no. There's suddenly a view in the US that China is a threat. Not a threat to the US in the territorial sense, but a threat to US dominance mm. in the world. And there's a mood in the US now that they must somehow curb, curtail, control, contain China, and if necessary, for some, go to war with China. Mm. And this is very dangerous because the passions of a uh, democratic electorate can sometimes get out of control. If, for instance, there's an incident in the South China Sea, then Congress, the US media will react in a way which even the White House cannot, cannot somehow contain or moderate. Yeah. I would assume, and having listened to your speech, that the US is probably on a wrong track here from your perspective, and, and that they are sort of getting China wrong. Well, if you were the president of the US, what would you do? Well, the, 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 the most important thing is to understand the nature of the challenge, and which means understanding China in its history, mm. in its philosophical underpinnings. Otherwise, if, you, if your assumptions are wrong, then your actions may lead not to success, but to tragedy. So it's important when we look at China, not just to view it on the basis of a few snapshots, yeah. but one must watch the entire video from its early beginnings. Yeah. Then its nature reveals itself. And China has a long history. And China is the challenge it is because he has a long civilization. The Chinese people are the biggest nationality in history. Mm. Why has this come to be? It wasn't an accident. Uh, China, with a population of 1.4 billion, is 92% Han. How can such a large country be so homogeneous? It cannot be by accident. It cannot be because of uh, the policies of one or two dynasties. 
it is deep in the culture that they they are most comfortable among themselves. We take Europe. Europe has about maybe half the population of China. Hey. And we're in Italy. Hey. We are in Florence. You are from Finland. Each has its history, its, its traditions, its heroes, its myth. But the whole of China has only one literature. Has only one set of myths to which all Chinese people sus- subscribe to. And because of the nature of this civilization, it has a very different uh, character. The Chinese people are not expansionists, not because they can't be expansionists, but they find it troublesome to incorporate you know, Chinese people into their area. Sounds a little bit like the Finns sometimes. You know? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're only 5.5 million, very peculiar language and no one else speaks it. But I, I guess what I was struck by when I you know, read your speech and, and then listened to it is you could also make a comparison, I guess, to India, to a certain, because India will now surpass China in terms of population, but it is, of course, a little bit more diverse, much less homogenous. And in your speech, you also talk about you know, the notions of harmony and the notions of a sort of a legalistic perspective. Can you explain that a little bit? No, India is much more like um, Yeru. Mm. It has a common civilizational basis in the Hindu and Islamic beliefs. The way Yeru would have the Judeo-Christian values and the inheritance of Greece and Rome. Mm. Uh, but politically, India has never been united until the British came. And mm. it has no political culture of being united over centuries. For China, it's like Rome resurrecting itself again and again in European history. Europe never did. I mean, not, not that there were not attempts by Charles the Great or by Frederick Barbarossa or by uh, Bismarck or Hitler or whatever, or Napoleon. But China always did. So there is a political culture of being, of seeing the ideal in being a united Poverty, and then makes it very different from Europe and from India. So, what, what what do you say when you hear you know a lot of Westerners, people from the global South, or you know the US and Europe saying, "Oh, you know, you know, it's expansionist or imperialist, just like Russia, and we need to decouple and the rest of it." What, what's your you know as a Singaporean, what's your reaction? Well. I'm ethnic Chinese. Singapore is three quarters Chinese, so I think we do have some understanding of the nature of China. I don't think they they see profit in conquering foreign lands and yeah. in incorporating foreign nationalities into the body politic. In the end, it will lead to Greece. They're quite happy for the Americans to play their role, yeah. not because they don't want to challenge America, but they think that in the end, it will lead to no good. They are too old. They have seen too much to see benefit in trying to impose their values on others. Their approach is this. I have not problems with my family. It's a big family. No problems. And your family, well, good luck to you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> to think that I can help you solve your family problems is to them absurd. Yeah. Just as you cannot solve my family problems. How about Chinese patience? Where where does that come from? Because I've you know I've always read stories about oh you know for the Chinese a century is only a page in a book kind of a thing, and there seems to be that you compare that to a lot of other big powers around the world. A lot of other powers they can be aggressive, they can be quite quick in their moves. You know the American century was the last century, but before that it wasn't really. How about China and patience? Where does it come from? From, from a sense of their own history. Because this, the, the dramas are reenacted on the same plains, along the same rivers, surrounded by the same mountains. And for everything they do, they can't avoid precedence. There is no country on earth which is as wedded to its own history as China. It's not possible to have any conversation in China without recurring references to what has been done in similar situations in the past. That makes it a very conservative civilization. Mm. It's always been autocratic. Such a vast land mm. cannot be organized in any other way. Mm. So the hope that you can somehow make China in the image of Western Europe yeah. is a pipe dream. Yeah. I think you're right. And interesting enough, I mean, you know, I, I belong very much to the sort of Fukuyama school, end of history. And, you know, I believed also that, you know, 
after the end of the Cold War, all of us would revert to liberal democracy, market economy, and globalization. And with that, also China, there was this feeling. But of course, China is a different kettle of fish. And, and in, in that sense, you don't see much change happening on that front. China has a long history, but most of that history is of China as uh, an empire where legitimacy of the emperor is based on the male line, mm. the ruling house. That's what conferred legitimacy on an emperor. Mm. And when he loses the medal of heaven, then there's a period of turmoil, and a new dynasty, a new family comes to position. And that revolution from imperial China, the Republican China, created probably, in my view, the greatest revolution in human history. And the liberation of women in that revolution is almost unbelievable because everybody had harems, not just the unproof. Men had harems, wealthy men, and it was accepted. Okay. And women who were in high society had their feet bound for the sexual pleasure of men. So for all that to change within the short period was remarkable. And among Asian women, if you compare Chinese women to Japanese, to Korean, to Indian, to Malay women, Chinese women are the most liberated. This is still an ongoing experiment in China. And how do you then believe, I mean, if this is getting more about China than I expected, but it's always good with a free flow of conversation. So, so you take, you know, 1979 and the opening of, of China. Do you see this continue? Because, of course... China has gone from rugs to riches. I mean, you talk a lot about it yourself as well. We've, we've seen it become the, one of the biggest economies in the world. I think in the speech, you even talked about it being about you know, half of the world's economy by 2050, et cetera, et cetera. Will opening of China continue economically? Yes, because the, the Chinese people want to do better. They are right now per capita, maybe 20% of US per capita. Surely they can reach half of US per capita. By which time the Chinese economy will be equal to that of the US and the EU combined because of the logic of numbers. Yeah. And that desire for a better life uh, I mean, is unstoppable, regardless of how it's governed. But when China is well governed, then the infrastructure is in place, the progress will be very, very uh, rapid. Let's go to Europe and China then. You began by saying that you have a feeling that Europe could play a big role. So let's put you now in the, first you were in the shoes of the US president, now I put you in the shoes of, of the commission president uh, or a European leader. What should Europe do here? Europe is a great experiment in bringing tribal nations together in a, in a confederation. I was at uh, the archives uh, recently and it was interesting seeing how the foundations of Europe were carefully put into place over many decades. And these foundations lay the basis of a human experiment that despite differences of history, even of values, you can all come together, create meta-values, deal with each other, as brothers and sisters. This is a European experiment, and if it succeeds, it sets an example for the world. I feel very proud in being a part of the School of Transnational Governances. This is a school to, to delve into, to improve the European experiment. And you invite foreigners to join you, to understand why, what Europe is trying to do. If Europe succeeds, it's a lesson for the entire. You need the Western alliance with the Americans for a collective defense. But Europe has its own destiny from America, which is far away, which is surrounded by two oceans. I mean, Europe is complicated at one end of Eurasia. It's always had its internal tensions. It is not an enemy of China. It's too far away. And China can never be an enemy of Europe. So what role does Europe play in the coming decades? In this titanic struggle between China and the US, if Europe maintains the balance, there'll be no war. The Americans cannot go into war with China 
but Europe not supporting it. Good point. China cannot go into war with America, Europe not supporting it. Hmm. But this requires a strategic view of Europe, not only geopolitically, but also historically. China may, may have been a very good civilization, but Europe in all its diversity is probably contributed more to human civilization than any other continent because of its diversity, its ceaseless internal struggles. So, you know, one of the interesting things is, of course, if you look at the way in which China discusses or pitches the West, it separates between Europe and the US, whereas Russia sees very much the West as you know, Europe and the US together. So there's a quite a sort of fundamental difference in the approach. Actually, before we come to the conclusion of our talk, which has been fascinating, you know, my sort of sentiment right now is that if China really wanted to win the hearts and the minds of the global West, it would actually be the main peace mediator here. In a sense that I have a feeling that the only person who can call Putin right now is that, listen, Vladimir, time to stop this. So, you know, do you think we're going to move into that kind of a direction where, where China takes that role on the grand stage? Uh, not in that way. I think there would be, if conditions are right and they can play a catalytic role, they will play that role. But they do not see themselves as power brokers, as someone who can bring contending sects together. This is a distant war for them. If Europe and Russia are neighbors on China's borders, then they may take a more interventionist approach. But for them, this is far away. And they don't believe, they fully understand the history of that conflict. And therefore, they're quite respectful to the fact that there's no panacea. But they said something recently which, which moved me. You know. They said, you can't negotiate if in your heart you don't open up to the possibility of reconciliation. It begins with the human heart. Okay. If both sides see a zero sign, then there can be no peace. That, that is always, I think, the most difficult thing with finding the war and peace. And then there are, of course, nations and societies that are able to cope with their past. I would argue that Germany was quite good at that after World War II. But then probably, you know, I say this as a Finn, that uh, Russia has made very well at dealing with its Soviet past. But these are the types of difficult dilemmas. I think it's a wonderful way to uh, end it. George, many thanks for uh, being here with us and having a discussion. And to all of our viewers, uh, I think this has been one of the most fascinating conversations that we've had. Our aim is to break it, basically give depth and understanding from different perspectives around the world on what is going on in geopolitics right now. I at least come out of this conversation understanding China much better than I used to. Hope you do as well and hope to see you soon in the next episode.